Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker, and I'm very excited about the guest I have on today. Very special guest, uh, Chris Van Campen, who's currently actually based in Japan. But one of the reasons he wanted to come on my program is that he's the editor of this uh, of the series of essays, Rescuing the Restoration, The Lord Sets His Hand Again, A History and Explanation of the Restoration um, movement written by participants within the movement. And so this is a series of essays of people who have written um, these these essays. And it, and when we say the restoration movement, we are actually referring in specifically to the, the movement that Denver Snuffers followers are involved in. Would that be an accurate assessment there? Yes, good morning and thanks for having me. Um, yes, that is I'll correct in that, yeah, I'm we say movement for lack of a better term, but yeah, generally people who are mostly folks that have come out of the Mormon faith and have kind of opened their eyes to the fact that there's a whole lot of more truth out there that we can find. So, yeah, and and you're a fascinating guy because you actually have an interesting story to tell, and I want to give get a little biographical and find a little bit more about you. But if we just had to summarize, who is Denver Snuffer? Who, how, if you, how would you describe him? Denver Snuffer is a teacher with a message from God, basically, is how I look at him. I don't, I, I, I would say, yeah, prophet, sure, um, in in that um, the description of a, a prophet scripturally is by their works, you, sh you shall know them. And, you know, to me, Denver Snuffer is exactly what he says he is, which is a teacher, a messenger. He doesn't hold himself out to be a leader or anything ostentatious. But I've, I've met with him several times, gone out to lunch with him. He strikes me as being exactly what he says he is, very authentic, um, doesn't seek anything for himself. He just wants to to do the errand that the Lord has sent him on. So that's that's my take on Denver Snuffer. So I was reading Ad Adrian Larson's um, part in this when he wrote the introduction. He actually says, he says he refers to him as a prophet as well. So I know that Denver himself shies away from the name. But yeah. you, but many of you do consider him a prophet, which is interesting. Of course, I've had Adrian on my program, and of course, I've had Denver Snuffer on my program. And so this program has had a relationship with this um, with the restoration movement uh, for a while now, and yes. uh, I, I really enjoy the conversations that I've been having. And so this 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 is as a matter of fact, it was Adrian that recommended me to you, uh, recommended this book, and recommended having you come on. So I, I feel like this is just a continuation of that conversation that I'm having with the restoration movement. And I think this would be very informative to the audience. And, uh, you know, there's so much to say about Denver Snuffer. But before we get there, I want us to talk a little bit about you and your background and how you got here. Okay. Um, actually, it's interesting you talk about Adrian. Adrian's brother and I were in the same apartment as missionaries in Japan way back, way back. And so he and I had, through a, an interesting series of events, it's probably too long and un, un, uninteresting for your listeners here, um, had gotten to be working together in the same company. And at the time, I was gospel doctrine teacher in my ward, and, and Reed is his name. Reed was, um, you know, actively involved in the in the church in his ward. And he would help me get my gospel doctrine lessons ready. And he, he started giving me all these um, little tidbits of information that really didn't sound like typical mainstream stuff. And so when we, when we got further into it and I opened the, the lid a little bit wider, it turns out that he and his wife were already um, had discovered Denver Snuffer's book, The Second Comforter. And this was just about the time that the you know, you've heard Denver talk about his 10 talks. And this was in the, the first part of the 10 talks were happening right then. And so um, the Larson family had this scripture study every week. Adrian had got on to Denver Snuffer in the writings, had introduced it to his family, and they were all pretty much uh, very into that. And so I started watching what they were doing. And my initial reaction was, oh, my gosh, you guys, you're going to get in trouble. And you know, and then that was right about the time then that the LDS church did their, we're not going to baptize the children of gay couples anymore. And um, that whole, that whole thing really just kind of 
opened my eyes to the fact that wait a minute you know i mean if you if you read third nephi 11 in the lds version of scripture that's what's called the doctrine of christ and um you know the there's no way period that you can square that alleged revelation with the doctrine of christ you just you just can't do it and so that and we're that referring really, to we're referring to what was called it the november policy yeah, uh, sure <laughs> and 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 this was and this was a big deal because and it's interesting because i talked to a lot of people where it's like a lot of a lot of shelves broke when that happened a lot of people um their view of the church changed when they issued that November policy. Now the church has since rescinded it, but it did do some damage. Well, and it, and it wasn't just a policy. I think John DeLynn, your your buddy John DeLynn, blew the lid off of that initially, where they just snuck it into the, the handbook. And then they came out with, the, it was kind of a hackneyed question and answer series or session with uh, Elder Christofferson, I believe I remember right where they announced it as a as a policy change that was supposed to be empathetic towards those families. And then and then they turned around and said, oh, it was a revelation received by President Monson. And you had that explanation given by Elder Nelson at the time about that that prophetic experience. And, you know, so it went from a secret policy in the handbook to a revelation. And then then a couple of years later, they undo it, you know. And it it just seemed really out of character for a church that claims to have authority and, and direct inspiration from God, you know. So and that, for that you, really kind of, yeah. And for you, that was that was what really changed things for you was when that happened, you you felt like this in your mind, in your interpretation of Mormonism, is that you uh, couldn't reconcile what was taught in the Book of Mormon. About the doctrine of Christ, and then what what the church was doing. So for you, that was that was that what, what were you up to that point? Maybe having some questions, or did everything just kind of open up? Did the, or did that cause questions to happen? Where where were you at in your journey? You know, I honestly think that every Mormon, if they're honest with themselves, has questions. Um, there's just some things. Some people, like my wife, had questions about the Word of Wisdom. Why can the average Mormon go down to the Maverick and fill up their 64 ounce jug of Diet Coke, and yet she can't drink her green tea, which is vastly more healthy for you than a jug of Diet Coke, right? So for her, it was a word of wisdom. For some people, it's Book of Abraham. You know, there's there's always going to be some question. It's just whether or not you allow yourself to, you know, open your eyes and open your heart and kind of accept that there might be other truth than what's being given to you by the the correlation committee at the LDS church, you know? Hmm. And so, so that's, that's where it happened for me. That's where it happened for you. So then what happens next? What, what, what is, what does your journey look like after that? Well, so after that, we continued to become more um, involved with the restoration movement. Um, right around that time, Adrian Larson and his wife, Tasha were excommunicated um, for no reason other than he wrote a blog and and we just kind of transitioned i mean there was no there was no big thing my wife and i were both on the same page which is a blessed miracle um i know that some families aren't quite that lucky on viewpoints um but yeah we just we just call it we graduated from the lds church we we were grateful that we were able to attend there and raise our kids there but um we also understand that there's there's more to life than uh, a corporate church. And so we just, we've drifted. And that's a good word is drift. We've drifted away from church and into full-on participation in, in movement. And we've we've done some interesting projects and participated in several different fellowships. And, you know, the fellowships are really where the, the movement lies is, is in those small group fellowships. Yeah. And, and I, I want to, I want to talk about that. Now, I was just was curious, were you also maybe aware of Rock, Rock Waterman and his pure Mormonism blog? Was that something you would be reading at the time as well? I, I discovered Rock Waterman after I, I, oh. I found Adrian's first um, okay. to the Red was Adrian's. And so, you know, because we'd been friends with Adrian and, and Reed and that whole family for quite some time, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I was, I was familiar with Adrian's writings and had even in fact used some of his writings in gospel doctrine lessons and, I, I would sneak Denver stuff in there once in a while, but 
but um yeah after that after the november policy and and uh, my experience with that um i i made the comment in one of my lessons that heaven is a tall place and the church is an awfully short ladder and <laughs> i was really shortly thereafter so yeah, I saw that, and when you wrote that, that's a. Did you make that out? Because I hadn't heard that one before. That sounds. Yeah, good. that was me. That was me. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so you would say that since we're just talking about your the the movement, and you mentioned the, the fellowships, yeah. um, you know, this is very familiar to me because a lot of like uh, churches that uh, I've been affiliated with, you know, or attended would have like house groups att attached to them as well, Bible studies and weekly house groups. And would you say that you're basically, your group does not have actually a Sunday church building that you guys attend. You actually just meet in people's homes like they did in the first century church? That's correct. Um, there is no ownership of land, property, no contracts, no leases, no rentals, no, there's no buildings at all. It's just all done in homes or parks or once in a great while, we might, you know, grab a community center or something if it's going to be a large fellowship. Um, and it's all done at personal cost and expense. There's no pooling of funds for anything other than saving for that temple that we're going to build in the future. So you do you do tithe, but the tithe goes to? The tithing is done uh, exclusively in the fellowships. And if there's needy among the fellowships, then then the tithing is shared with with that individual in the fellowship. Um, once in a great while, there's a, a need in this fellowship and this fellowship has surplus. And so there has been, you know, some sharing across fellowships on occasion, but we don't really have a, a clearing house or any sort of, you know, method for pooling funds. Okay. And then you're in Japan. So what's it like to in be Japan. part of the restoration movement in a country like Japan? And how does that work for you and your spiritual walk and fellowship? Well, on the one hand, it's quite lonely. Um, you know, we're the only two that we know of in Japan. We haven't been able to rustle up any other people that we know of. But we have some um, people that are involved that are scattered across Asia. We have some in Laos. We have Philippines fellowships. And there was one in Taiwan, but he returned to the U.S. So um, it's interesting because in late, let's see, it was late. Late 2019, we started planning to have a regional conference where we could gather all of the Asia people together and maybe some folks from the States could come over and we could kind of, you know, fellowship together. And it was called the Search for All Truth Conference. And we had Shinto priests lined up and Buddhist priest and a really popular, well-known Japanese Baptist minister, had a couple of them, had a couple of people from the remnant movement lined up. And we were, we we're going to rent the little community center here in town and we had 50 or 60 people reserved and then the whole COVID thing hit. And so in April, 2020, when it was supposed to happen, um, we postponed until October and things got worse, not better. So then we converted it to an online meeting. And so um, that YouTube channel from the, the Restor or the search for all truth conference is still up and those videos are available. But so we've been mostly, um electronic fellowshipping for the past couple of years you know we haven't been able to get to the conferences we watch online as much as we can and so it's it's a real blessing to have that electronic stuff you and i wouldn't be talking today without this venue for example so well we'll make sure you, you will that you send me a link so that people can watch some of those videos i i had mentioned you had mentioned this to me when we were talking the other day about this ja well-known japanese baptist minister uh, maybe talk a little bit about just you engaging him and how you were able to get him to actually come and talk to your group. Um, his name is Arimasa Kubo, and I came across him because he he actually has a publishing company called Remnant Publishing, if you can believe it. And uh, so that's how I, I came across him. And as I researched him, I found that he'd been on uh, the TV quite a bit, and his his main message is the literal descendancy of the Japanese people from the House of Israel. And he's 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 gathered this vast body of evidences that that the, the Japanese um, and a lot of the culture, uh, a lot of the historically significant religious traditions stem from 
having once been part of the house of Israel and, and the location of their travel. He's gone and traced it back through the Korean peninsula, through China, through the Middle East and back to, you know, the motherland, as it were. So, so I just reached out to him via email and he was like, oh, yes, this sounds like a great thing. And um, initially he was unsure he'd be able to travel because of um, a health issue within his family. And so I think his talk was always going to be uh, a pre-recorded thing. But then, you know, the the whole event became an online event. So it was it was good to be able to get his talk in advance and put subtitles on it and then put it up on the on the on the website. And and honestly, his talk has had over 20,000 views at this point and has really made our little YouTube channel blossom over on that side. Wow. So very interesting. And of course, that's a fascinating thing. So somebody like him might be interested in something like the Book of Mormon because it's kind of talking about a scattering and a, a founding of a land. And so uh, it would be, you know, that's an interesting theory. I'd love to hear more about that. The idea that Japan, the Japanese are descendants of Israel. That's a fascinating hypothesis. And I imagine it's it must be really interesting. Well, and his talk he gave us is... I don't know, 45 or 50 minutes long and just just really lays out the case very mm. clearly. So, yeah, you should probably watch that talk. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Well, that's great. So I, I find, you know, like I said, I've had Denver and Adrian, of course, Rock Waterman on. So, you know, we've been having these conversations and now I'm having you coming on. And it's kind of like I'm having a series, like each each one of my interviews could be like a chapter, a chapter in a book of essays uh, like this, you know, and uh, I, I wanted to say, I, you know, this was actually came out of the ashes of another uh, Brian Hales project that he was attempting to, to do. And you guys talk about this in the book that uh, Adrian's introduction originally was supposed to be part of that book. And then that project gets dropped. And then you guys kind of pick up the torch and, and go go with it. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I think you're familiar with the, the the first stage of that, which is Brian Hales was going to write a book about the movement, um, not necessarily a supportive book, I think. And so in the interest of balance, he wanted to um, get somebody within the movement to write an introduction for his book. And he approached Rock Waterman first. And my understanding is that Rock actually wrote a couple of pieces that Brian just didn't like. And so Brian moved on to Adrian Larson, because um, Adrian's quite a well-known blogger and writer. And Adrian wrote a, a an introductory chapter for him. And then I think the Hales book just never got off the ground because he, he really couldn't find anyone to be critical of the movement. And so um, sometime after that, Adrian just you know packaged that introductory chapter that he'd written up and emailed it out to everybody he could think of and said, hey, I wrote this. If it's of use to anybody, or if you can think of something cool to do with it. And I'm pretty sure that in the back of Adrian's mind, he knew that it was a good outline for a book. And that's what he hoped somebody would do with it. And so I, the, the, the moment I read it, I thought, well, this is a great outline for a book about the movement for, you know, to hand to somebody that has questions about it, but no idea what it is, or someone who's new to the movement. Because, you know, it, it starts with the history and origin through, you know, Joseph Smith and goes all the way up through well, what's going to happen in the future so so i emailed adrian and i said you know this needs to be a book and he says well i don't have time to do it so go for it and so and so i my concept was well each of the sections of adrian's introduction could be parsed or part partitioned out into a chapter and then get one person to write each of the chapters and so we we rounded up some writers um i think there's 16 chapters and we went through about 30 different people to get the 16 chapters done. Um, you know, some people said yes early on, but didn't have time to do it and and so on. So, but, it, you know, it was it was really nice to be able to get to know a bunch of people within the movement that I didn't already know and and um, to get this thing put together. And and like I said, it's, it's designed to be a, a primer. The, the original concept was, Here's a book you can hand to your Mormon friends or relatives to explain what this wacky thing is you're doing, you know, and, and that was the original intended audience. And hopefully it goes from there. OK. And so basically, you, did you just put out the word to basically everybody, to people just in, in within the movement and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm putting together this book. These are the, the topics that we want to have covered. 
uh, would you like to submit something? Is that is it basically just a call for papers in essence? In essence, yeah. I, I just sent out an email to the same basic email list that Adrian used to send out the original introduction. And I said, hey, we're, we're looking for, you know, a team for a writing project. And and some people volunteered and I approached and asked some people directly if they would, wouldn't mind doing a chapter for us. And, and so over time, it took it took about 11 months to get the thing from okay. from initial proposal to we're ready to go to print. Oh, wow. That's actually pretty good. And 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 uh, have you ever done this before? What how is it that you were recruited to do this in the first place? I wasn't recruited in any way other than I got that in the email and I read it and said, this needs to be a book. And then that would not let go of my brain. So it was, I would call it an inspired recruitment then, if that's what you want to call it. Okay. Okay. And with this book, what kind of feedback have you been getting from, uh, from people on this? What, what, what kind of, what's the word on the street? The word on the street is that it is exactly what it was intended to be which is a very it's good and informative background in history on the re restoration movement uh it talks about you know who denver is and why he's kind of the cornerstone of it it talks about practices and beliefs and talks about um, some of the major projects that have done um, restoration archive for example which is the repository of all the history it talks about some of the conferences that have been done it, talks about saving for a temple and what that means building zion um so it's it's kind of a really good overview that has been quite useful for newcomers and and also to answer questions that you know people around the movement might have so uh yeah yeah and uh you know i one of the things you had mentioned was building a temple and you guys talk a little bit about that in the book. And I actually asked Denver about that. Would that be significant if your group were to put, build a temple? He said, oh yes, that would be very significant. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I, I just want to know, like this, this sounds like something you guys are collecting the money. Yeah. That's, that's like, okay, your your all your money stays in within the fellowships, but then there's this, the outlying, the the uh, the whatever extra that people might have goes into the temple fund, and as of the writing of this book, one hundred percent of that money is still there, waiting to be spent. So, may, tell me a little bit about this. Like, is this? Do you guys have uh, uh, architectural drawings? Uh, you know, what a location picked? What what what's what's going to be the deal with this temple? So, currently, there is no location that I'm aware of. Um, the 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 money has all been pooled and has not been spent on anything but you know typically within the restoration movement nothing really happens as an entire group or an entire body like the book that we did one person had the idea to do it put together a small group to finish it um i know you're aware of the new scriptures that we did yeah um these were also done by actually two groups that got together to become one but there was no no movement wide hey we need to do some new scriptures so if there's some initial work being done on a temple, it's by an inspired individual that's doing it. And maybe not everybody's aware of it. I, I can't say yes or no that that's the actual case. But, you know, given that the kind of the emphasis or the push of the entire restoration movement is to build Zion and Zion has at its cornerstone a temple, then, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are at least thoughts and things that are going in 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 motion towards that end and you we talked right before we started taping i'd asked you what about the temple lot in in independence missouri that's the place where a lot of people within the restoration as a whole believe the temple would be built but you you seem to say that that may not necessarily be the spot where the temple would be built well you know if you go back and read um some of the things that joseph smith talked about zion and in fact, he uh, he was headed there right before his assassination. But the Zion is in the, the the Rocky Mountains of the West, and and that was always his intention was to get out west and and build Zion out here or out there. I say out here because I'm from the West, but <laughs> anyway, um, and so I don't think that we need to limit ourselves to one location. The the saints picked that location. They approached the Lord, asked for his permission to build a temple there. He said, sure, go ahead. You have, you know, you, you have the assignment to build a temple, get it done. And then just didn't get it done. So 
I, I don't know that that is any longer a valid requirement to build it there, especially given the, you know, all of the prophecies are the mountain of the Lord's house, right? And I, I don't think that Jackson County, Missouri is well known for its mountainous terrain. So it, it's my belief, and I think most of us believe that it will be somewhere in a mountainous location in the West when we're finally given that location. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's that's so fascinating because, you know, uh, one of the things I remember, I mean, I've been following Denver for a very long time. I watched a lot of his stuff on YouTube when he'd give the conference talks. I listened to a lot of his conference talks and and watched them, um, watched his, all the interviews that were the, done of him. So I've always been fascinated by him. I remember watching that episode where uh, where uh, John DeLynn had John Hamer on, and they had found that chart with all the bubbles on it, and Denver's bubble was bigger than John DeLynn's, which I'm sure they, he was like, why is that bigger? <laughs> um, and it seemed that, it, at the, you know, the, the church also, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also is, it has a close eye on Denver Snuffer as well. Um. Yeah. Now, when Denver was on your program, he gave a def definition of, I think it was priesthood keys, that the church website, he read from the church website, church, or priesthood keys are the authority to control God's work on earth or some some such thing. And and Denver was like, well, that that runs absolutely contrary to the LDS scripture, Doctrine and Covenants, section 84, which is the priesthood can never control it's to be uh, exercised with faith and long suffering and and persuasion and meekness and 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 so on right and then after he said that i was doing preparation for one of our devotionals that we do here in japan every sunday and i went to pull that up and that definition has now changed on their website oh interesting so i can't say for a certainty that one had to do with the other but I found the timing to be very interesting. Oh, interesting, interesting. You know, and this is the thing, too, that really struck me about Denver, because, of course, before I started my channel, I didn't know anybody who was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I didn't know anybody that, that believed in the Book of Mormon and the Scripture. I didn't know the context of Denver's snuffer. And it wasn't until I attended last year's Mormon History Association and I started engaging just, I mean, literally nobody knew who I was. I knew who they all were because like I've been reading all their books and I'm, I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. And I'm talking to scholar after scholar and Denver, Denver's name would periodically come up. And what I found so interesting was that nobody hated on him. They took him very seriously and respected a lot of his work. So I thought, okay, this guy is not viewed as a crackpot. That that he is taken seriously, even in the scholarly community, which I thought was really, really interesting. You know, I will honestly say that I am not aware of anyone that is a more qualified LDS historian or scholar than Denver Snuffer. I mean, he he reads the stuff and then he goes and purchases or acquires or finds the background material for the stuff. And he, he wants to base his entire analysis on original documents. And so he's he's gone to quite a lot of expense and effort to assemble original documentations for all of his positions. And I think it, it does make a big difference. It, it um, you know, the phrase, the history, what is it? History belongs to the victors or something like right, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's always a twist when you read a written history, but if you can get to the original source documents, you, you often find that that does not necessarily reflect the, the current narrative. So I think that's where Denver excels is he's gone to the root source and the Joseph Smith papers project has helped that tremendously. You know, any, any Joe Schmuckatelli can now go read the Joseph Smith papers and find out that, that the history that's, you know, maybe been relied on recently is not accurately reflected in what happened at the time. Yeah. And I just think it's interesting because I'm a book guy and you guys are, you you put out books, you put out uh, your own canon. Um, I had the opportunity to to hold the series of scriptures that you guys have. I had I'd love to get a copy, a cop, some copies one of these days. Um, but it's 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 there. It's a beautiful set, and it and and this is the thing. Like I, <laughs> you know, the 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 scriptures that are part of your movement. Like for instance, this is the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim. Um, this is put. This is on uh, goat skin, I believe. And you guys are not charging an arm and a leg for these. 
Um, you know, these, these are very expensive books and you're basically producing them for not much above cost as best I can tell. I mean, if Jimmy Swagger prints his own Bibles and if he had these, he's paying, you're paying 100, 150 bucks for one of these guys. So I, I give a lot of credit to the movement that they're creating these beautiful scriptures and that they could be charging a lot more for and they're not. What's the, what's the, what's the, uh, the thought behind that process of doing that? Well, Behind creating the scriptures or selling them at cost? Because they were selling them at the price that you are. Is it because, first of all, you want to create something that's a high quality product, but you uh, but you also want to make it, it, it affordable for people, which I think is a, a commendable thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that has corrupted virtually every religion ever in the history of the world is the money. Yeah. The, the fact that a religion is an excellent way basically to print money. And we, as a as a group, completely shun and shy away from that. So nothing we do ever is for money. And so the only thing that we do with the scriptures is we have um, taken the, the cost of printing and shipping the scriptures because they come from overseas. And then there's, there's a slight markup in there. And then that funding is used for sh shipping to people who can't necessarily... Um, run down to Boise or to Salt Lake and pick up their copy. So there's some shipping costs. There's some people in the movement that just simply can't afford a hundred dollar set of scriptures. And that's what, that's basically what there is about a hundred bucks mm -hmm. for the three leather bound set. And so it's, you know, it's obviously a, a good price, but, but some people still can't afford that. So there's, there's some slush built in there to be able to send people who can't afford scriptures. And then, um, my understanding is that they're now gearing up for a second printing of these, not a second edition, but a second a printing, printing because we've just about sold through the, the initial purchase. So, OK, oh, wow. And, you know, one of the criticisms I heard leveled against the, the scriptures. And again, if this is not an area that you're super familiar with, maybe I should ask Adrian these questions. But but one person who's part of one of the independent restoration movements in Independence, Missouri, said, why did they do a different versification? We already have the issue of the RLDS edition and the LDS edition. And we're trying to bring unity to the movement. And now we've got a third set of, of scripture that, that that uses different versification. What was the reasoning to do that? Because the scripture, the scripture committee, as we call them, really tried to be as faithful as possible to what Joseph Smith had, had set out to do. And so they they, for example, with the um the uh well, you call it the joseph smith translation right uh joseph smith called it the fullness of the scriptures i think but no bible not even the the restoration group in missouri contained all of what joseph smith did so so basically it's impossible to unify versification in the first instance because nobody was including all of Joseph Smith's fullness of the gospel or fullness of the scriptures. Okay. Um, secondly, a lot of the versification of the Book of Mormon and uh, the punctuation was done uh, at the at the printing press. Right, right. but granted, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was something that was arbitrarily thrown out there. And so, to to go back to how Joseph originally had it lined out meant changing that, obviously, and then versification in the in the doctrine and covenants we you know it, that got changed because i th i think what we've done is laid them out chronologically and the lds church's version didn't have that um we have a much more full record than the lds church includes in the doctrine and covenants and so just just mostly based on the different information the different quantity of information and the different structure I mean, for goodness sake, Joseph Smith wanted the Book of Mormon and the New Testament in the same volume, and that's what we've done. So that that in and of itself changes things up tremendously. So oh yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah, so, that's that's okay. Yeah, show me that edition of the Book of Mormon. Let me see that. I don't know if you can see it. It's called the New Covenants. Okay. Yep. This I can contains see it. the New Testament and the Book of Mormon in one volume. Okay. So that says volume two. I'm assuming volume one is the old testament. It's called the Old Covenants. Uh huh. Okay. And has that got the original? Does that have anything from the Apocrypha in there, or Deuterocanonical books, or is it just uh, the standard thirty-nine Old Testament verses that are used by the Protestants? 
with some modification. Um, Joseph Smith's, you know, translation is in there, right. and um, the Book of Moses from the LDS Pearl of Great Price has been included with the Book of Genesis. Um, you know, that also is going to modify versing, yep. obviously. So, so it's 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 structured a little bit differently, but more akin to what Joseph had indicated he was trying to do with the scriptures. Yes. Okay, and then volume three, what is that all about? Volume three is what we call teachings and commandments. Okay. Which is essentially doctrine and covenants just, you know, put together in, in a little bit more. Well, you also have the lectures on faith as well in there too, right? Lectures on faith has been restored to the scriptures, yes. Okay. Lectures on faith is, is in here. Um, Book of Abraham is in here. The okay. The entire thing of Joseph Smith history is in there. Wow. Okay, that's very fascinating. And so now, do you guys, in one sense, you say this, these scriptures were put together by a committee. Do you feel this committee was guided by the Holy Spirit in producing these? I would say that's, in my in my view, that's an absolute certainty, yes. Okay. In many ways, people believe like the committee that did the King James Bible might have been guided by the Holy Spirit. You're saying a similar thing about this, about, about the putting together of, of your scriptures as well. I, yes, I, I think that is an accurate statement. And, you know, honestly, I, I wish there was more folks like you that are interested in additional scripture. Um, a, a lot of folks that believe in the Bible close their canon at the Bible. And that, that to me seems like a pity, because if there's another testament of Jesus Christ, you know, that you, you don't have to be a Mormon to read the Book of Mormon. You know what I mean? It's it it seems to me like it's an opportunity to learn more about Jesus Christ. And if he's truly the center of your world, why would you not pick up the Book of Mormon and read it? Hmm. You know, it's just yeah. yeah. Well, I, I I appreciate you uh, being that that bridge in a lot of ways. Well, I just think that you know, I think there's a few things from my background that kind of, first of all, even as a little kid, I recognize this, no, that doesn't make sense to say the canon's closed because then essentially the Protestants have become Catholics because it's the Catholics that close the, the, the canon. So to me, it's only just, a, it's a logical extension of Protestantism to be open to the idea of new scripture, but also being part of the charismatic movement, we, we, we had to butt heads against the cessationists who say, no, 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 there's no more gifts, no more speaking in tongues, no more prophesying, no more healing. And we had to, we had to push back on it. Now, of course, we're the dominant uh, group in Christianity now. I mean, there's a half billion of us. And by the middle of this century, there'll be more charismatic uh, Pentecostals and there will be Muslims. So uh, in one sense, we won that battle. But I kind of look at it from the perspective of... Uh, I can see why I, I can't be as a man say, well, no, God, we're not open to new scripture. We've closed the canon, don't you see? And that, to me, that's a very man-centered view of scripture. Yes. And and what parent, what parent stops talking to their child at some point in their life, right? Uh -huh. Never. You know, so yeah, I, I think that um well, in fact, Denver talked about that very topic where he he was reading from a paper where the the researchers were trying to determine where whether God man is created in God's image, but oftentimes God is created in man's image. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's what we put into our brains that defines what God is in a lot of ways, and and um, and that that's really one of the interesting things about the whole restoration movement, right? Yes. Is is breaking down those walls around what we've been taught God is, is not necessarily the entirety of what God is, you know, so. There was a great book written in the 1990s called The Ironic Christian Companion. And the author, uh, somebody asked him about the Book of Mormon. And this is a Christian author. And he said, well, 10,000 years from now, historians are going to be calling this period of time the early church period. In other, in other words, in the context of, of history, uh, it, it, it could be, and that was how he viewed the Book of Mormon, that maybe given time. Now, again, I'm not saying, I'm not canonizing the Book of Mormon, folks. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying is that within the context of history, we don't know 
where things will lead. I'm not saying the Book of Mormon is going to be, uh, you know, canonized in the future or anything like that. But I'm saying that within the context of 10,000 years from now, the historians are going to be talking about the first 2,000 years of, of the church like we talk about the first 200 years of the church. It will be almost like the same compression. So I, I find that, you know, a, a really good way of trying to look at it and grapple with it. Well, sure. I th I think that, you know, we all grapple with what is truth mm -hmm. and even within the movement right now there's there's some grappling going on about you know the scriptures and can we add to them or are they fine the way they are and and honestly in my mind the presence or absence of a document in a canonized set of scriptures has very little to do with the truth of that document. Hmm. Um, you know, for example, Denver Snuffer gave a talk a few years back called The Divine Parents, in which he talked about, you know, the, the Heavenly Father and the Heavenly Mother. And it's just, it's just a beautiful talk. It's dripping with truth. It explains so much. It makes so much sense, at least to me. And so my truth is that that talk is absolutely scripture. Okay, but it is not canonized and printed in this volume. I mean, right. it, it doesn't it doesn't really make a difference about the truth of a thing, whether or not it's in Scripture. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, that's fascinating, of course. Yeah, I mean, and 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 the thing about too is what I find so interesting about Denver Snuffer is you have this group that b boldly asserts we have just we have just expanded the canon and we're doing this bold thing and we're got this we got this all these things and and what what's familiar to me is what's so interesting to me is that when you read denver snuffer when you study his works i think a person who's familiar with joseph smith would see a very similar character because he's doing very similar things that joseph was doing in other words he is he's not just kind of just put stopping and just say okay we, we got we're just going to work with what we have he's expanding and joseph smith did a very similar thing he did a lot of expansion on doctrine and and, and giving new uh revelation and stuff like that would you say that uh, there's there are parallels between joseph smith and denver snuffer I, I would say there's absolutely parallels yes and 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 a, and a thorough examination of joseph smith will reveal that he really never wanted to organize a church per se and even at the end of his life, he had kind of left the operation of the church to others. And he was he was doing his Council of 50 stuff. And, you know, he had he had kind of moved on from it. And um, and I think that what you notice about Denver is he's very expansionist about the gospel. But he's very, very we cannot establish any sort of hierarchy or institution because that, you know, that just anything that can be corrupted will be corrupted. And so we're really trying, and it's hard. It's really hard because of the institutional background that all of us came out of. Everybody is, their their first instinct or their first habit is, is to, hey, we need to, we need to process this. We need to, we need to formalize this. We need to get an approval structure. And, and it's, it's hard to resist that impulse to not, you know, organize something. Because when when that happened around what Joseph Smith was doing, you know, it, it kind of led to the downfall of, or at least the temporary cessation or pausing of the restoration that Joseph was trying to accomplish. So it's really just picking up where Joseph left off and further expanding what he was trying to do. You know, and I, I think I talked about this on my Mormon Stories interview, where I talk about how there's a similar similar, similar parallel on, on in our movement in that a lot of your charismatic and Pentecostal churches were founded in where there was there was healings, there was speaking in tongues, there was a lot of things very similar to the early church of Christ, you know, in the 1830s. And and then what happens is it's all very spontaneous, it's all led by the spirit. And then, but man then decides, well, we got to put a building on it. We got to put a bureaucracy on it. We got to put a structure on it. And so now those very churches that came out of the Azusa Street revivals are just as kind of mundane and 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 boring as the very churches that those people were coming out of that they wanted more. And then we have a similar thing on our side where we see uh, that same parallel 
where a man wants to 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 kind of, and I'm not saying this about Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints. I'm not saying this to be, point uh, to any group in particular. I'm just talking about this in general. This is a general thing that almost every church you can see where there was a spark of the spirit, and then it it kind of gets dimmed as, as each generation goes along. You, do you kind of see that? Yeah, and you know, you kind of couch it in a us and a them. No, no, no. I'm just talking about. You are you know, moving, you're, you're moving, but yeah, but, well, there's parallels. I think we're both there's, very, there's, well, there's so many similarities, yeah. And I don't see why we can't all just be the same movement. I mean, if it all originates with God and originates with the spirit, then why can't we all just be friends? You know, why can't we all just get along, right? Yeah, I get that. I get that sense too. Now, that, but I also look at it this way. And again, I'm I'm doing I'm helping facilitate these conversations, helping to build these bridges, oh, yes. and 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 I feel like we need to also acknowledge this is what we can agree on, but this is where we differ, and 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 rather than to be some kind of like a sloppy econ, economic ecumenical movement where oh we'll just we won't really care about all the I want no I want us to care about the doctrines that separate us too because I I feel it's important that we also have those conversations, but I also think it's important that we also look at it and say. Is Christ in the center of the endeavor? And let's always try to be Christ-centric no matter where we're coming from. And that's where I think we can find unity and common purpose. I, I agree with you. I just I just had a conversation the other day with somebody where I kind of, you know, imagine a wagon wheel without a hub, right? A wagon wheel is a big outer circle with a bunch of spokes. And if you don't have that center hub, then it's useless. But if you attach all of those spokes, some of which are coming at it, from 180 degrees different angle and if the christ is that hub we're all going to get to the same place eventually anyway and, and we've got this strong cohesive useful wagon wheel unit i mean it doesn't matter where we're coming from or what we think as long as we're going to the same hub that's that's my view on it well i think that's a great uh analogy i just wanted to say of course this is rescuing the restoration book I got this here. I've I'm, I've I've been in contact with, uh, with the, of course, with many of you in the in the restoration movement. I want to let you know that I really do appreciate all of you. Uh, my all of my interactions with the members of the restoration movement have been overwhelmingly positive, and I really feel also very comfortable conversing with you because I almost feel like we talk the same lingo sometimes. As a charismatic talking to a snuff a snuff right, if you will, is their nickname. I feel <laughs> like. Like, you know, okay, I kind of like, I feel comfortable talking to you guys. I, I do. And I think you guys feel comfortable talking to me. And let's continue talking. And uh, this book here, was there anything else about this book that you wanted to talk about or maybe bring to the to people's attention? Um, Just that if you do have any questions about the movement, I think you'll find a, at least an entree with this book. That's and great. I think you're just going to find that we're not a bunch of wacky religious zealots who have turned our back on the mormon church we are actually seeking more truth and light and that's that's what the direction and the focus of the movement is and um so that's 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 why we did this book is to help you know i'm sure there are plenty of moms and dads and brothers and sisters out there that are worried about the eternal damnation of their wayward relatives hand them this book and say this is what we're doing and i think that will go a long way to solving some of those concerns that's what the purpose of the book is well of course we're entering into the christmas season the holiday season and of course sitting at the table together uh being able to have conversations especially for those of you who have have since left the one church for another um that can also cause a lot of stress during this time of year so let's just try to look at this christmas season folks is let's try to sit down at the table with people maybe you don't necessarily agree with or maybe they've left your church and why don't you maybe ask them questions and also consider reading this book uh, so you could have, be better informed as to why maybe a family member or a close friend of yours is no longer attending your ward, but is attending these fellowships. And, and then let's just have a Merry Christmas and show some love and just have great conversations. Man, I think we're all on the same team. All right. Well, hey. Chris, you're an awesome dude. I'm so glad it's it's like eight o'clock in the morning there in Japan and nine o'clock now or whatever. And uh, I am so glad you uh, you came on the program today. Well, I really appreciate you having me. I, I thought it was a great conversation. I'd I'd love to sit down and talk with you more. I know you're really busy, but 
Well, we'll continue these conversations, folks. Like I tell people, I said, the conversations we have off camera with all my people are much more interesting than what we take. And so, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so, okay, folks, I'm going to have a link in the description for Rescuing the Restoration. Um, also, we're going to have a link to that website that we were talking about earlier for your group. And of course, I, I will put a, uh, a a link in the description for the Restoration Archives. Was there anything else, Chris, that, uh, anything else you want to say to the audience before I let you go? Um, just uh, take care of one another. Love that sounds that sounds right. That sounds just about right. We need that. Let's take care of each other and look out for each other. Folks, I just want to remind you that we'll have links in the descriptions to all the stuff we talked about today. Also in the links, we're going to have links to PayPal and Patreon so you can financially support the program. And thank you for all those who, of you who are. Also, mormonbookreviews.com is the merch store. You can get coffee mugs. You can get uh, t-shirts, hats, you name it. It's there. That So we do appreciate when people make purchases on our website as well. And just remember the most important thing, folks. All the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.